tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So we are making profiteers think twice about their flipping behavior. What difference will a tax on flipping homes in BC make to our tight housing market? There hasn't been, uh, I don't think it's all that much speculation occurring in the market overall. Plus. Whoever wrote that book, they worked in residential school with us. They beat us, sexually abused us. Calls grow for the mayor of Quenelle to resign. We deserve better. It started with a controversial book about residential schools. Quinnell is in my heart, and I'm not about to abandon it. And... We all love hockey. We're Canadian. People love this sport, and there's got to be room for everybody. Where to play? The closure of a Vancouver rink is bad news for all kinds of hockey teams. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. If you own property in BC and want to sell or buy, it could soon cost you more if you choose to sell quickly. The province has introduced a new bill for a much talked about flipping tax and a second legislation to speed up the process to build new homes. But as Mira Baines reports, critics say the money the tax brings in may be underwhelming. The province says the flipping tax is designed to help free up more homes for people who want to live in them, not people looking to profit off of them. BC's finance minister officially introduced the legislation today, but it will be retroactive to include some properties bought in 2023 or 2024. Income from residential property resold within two years will be subject to tax. Starting next year on January 1st, a 20% tax will be slapped on profit that property owners make after selling the property within the first year of buying it. The tax rate would slide to zero over the course of the second year after purchase. We are making profiteers think twice about their flipping behavior. There will be exemptions available in special life circumstances, including death, job relocation and divorce. Some critics say the tax will not move the dial on housing affordability or availability. The BC Real Estate Association has said they've calculated the tax will lower sales in the province by 1.7% and have a minimal impact on home prices. Some experts believe people may decide to hold off selling their property, leading to less housing supply. And there's not going to be that much of a, of a shift because there hasn't been, uh, I don't think it's all that much speculation occurring in the market overall. Um, in fact, if we think about uh, those who may have purchased and they are in the short term looking to sell, they might delay some of that. Uh, sale. Still, the symbolic nature of the tax targeting property flippers sends a strong message according to this UBC professor. We really do have to break Canada's and especially BC's cultural addiction to high and rising home prices, which has incentivized many people to think like, ah, a home is going to be a great way to accrue wealth windfalls. About 4,000 properties are expected to fall under the tax initially, with revenue going towards housing programs. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. Meanwhile, it appears prospective home buyers are feeling the pinch, with Metro Vancouver home sales down as prices rise. The Greater Vancouver Real Estate Board says the number of homes that changed hands in March fell almost 5% from the same month last year. And it's not for lack of supply, as the total number of homes listed for sale in March rose over 20% compared to 2023. The prices are up, with the benchmark composite home price for Metro Vancouver standing at $1,196,800, up 4.5% from a year ago. For the first time in over a decade, the provincial government is putting out a call to the public. It says BC needs more power than ever, as the water we depend on to generate electricity is drying up. Michelle Gassoub has the details. For the first time in 15 years, BC Hydro is putting out a call for new power. Today, we're launching a competitive call for new sources of clean electricity. Demand for power in this province is expected to climb 15% by 2030. The province says in just a few years, it must add 3,000 gigawatt hours, enough electricity to service around 270,000 homes. 
We've got people who are making the switch to electric vehicles and heat pumps. We've got industry that wants to power up. And so for some time, planning has been in place around a call for power, knowing that we have to integrate more renewables into our system to make it more flexible and, and uh, resilient to a changing climate. The call comes as a changing climate is impacting the water BC depends on to generate electricity. In 2022, BC Hydro reduced power generation at some reservoirs because of drought conditions. And last year, it spent $450 million importing power from California. This year, BC will likely have to import energy again. We are facing a, a, a lower snowpack, as you've seen, and, and that will trigger imports um, uh, in the coming year. The exact amount is actually quite variable. We get a lot of um, surprising amount of inflow um, in the form of the spring rains and the summer rains in the north. So we'll, we'll see how that turns out. Hotter summers have also boosted BC's demands for power. We're seeing summer peaks now that we didn't have in this province where right. we have heating needs as yes. much as we have cooling needs. Um, and I think it's really looking at how do we most efficiently utilize the energy we have. For this call, the province will prioritize solar and wind energy. To be accepted, projects must be located in BC and connect to BC Hydro's existing systems. And First Nations must have at least 25% equity, a first for this province. And a move nations say is a critical one for economic reconciliation. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Homicide investigators are now looking into the death of a woman in South Vancouver. The force says the body of a 49-year-old was found early Wednesday morning near Rosemont Drive and East 57th Avenue. Detectives say at this point they believe her death is targeted. No one has been arrested yet. A BC man accused of carrying out three attacks in the 1990s in Ontario and what became known as the Woodland Rapist Cold Case has now been granted bail. 64-year-old Richard Neal is charged with kidnapping, sexual assault with a weapon, and making child pornography. The attacks all happened in Ontario, but Neal will now live with family members here in BC. He's required to wear an electronic monitoring device, and his lawyer says he is under strict bail conditions. His next court appearance is early May. West Vancouver police claim a joyride by a 13-year-old has left a very expensive car in shambles. Take a look. Last week, officers say they found this Lamborghini Huracan in a ditch off Highway 1 with no one inside. Police say they located a youth and a friend who they say were unable to control the car in the dark and rainy conditions. Nobody was hurt, but the 13-year-old is now facing several charges, including driving without a license. The force says the car's owner gave the youth the keys and permission to drive, but it's unclear whether he, they knew the driver was underage and didn't have a license. In Richmond, TransLink says construction on the new Capstan SkyTrain station will cause some service disruptions. Starting next Monday until May 24th, service will end at 9.30 p.m. between Bridgeport Station and Richmond Brig House, Monday to Friday nights. TransLink says there will be extra bus service available at those affected stations. Capstan is expected to open in the middle of this year. Calls are growing louder for the mayor of Quesnel to step down. Three city councillors, several First Nations and other locals are demanding he resign. As Betsy Trumpeter reports, it started with a controversial book about residential schools handed out by the mayor's wife. A large protest through the streets of Quesnel. People drum and sing as they march on City Hall Tuesday evening, packing the council chamber, filling the lobby, bringing with them tears and anger. Mr. Mayor, I have no choice but to ask for your official resignation from office as mayor so we can repair the damage done by you and your wife. There are growing calls for the mayor to resign that started with a controversial book about residential schools. The book, Grave Error, minimizes the traumatic impact of residential schools and denies that First Nations lost their language and culture there. The wife of Quinnell's mayor has been distributing the book. Mayor Ron Paul says he respects his wife's right to her own opinions. That's sparked outrage. Us as people, our elders, we deserve better than to having to come here to to prove that we went, our people went to residential schools, to prove that we were hurt, that we were broken. We deserve better. Whoever wrote that book, they worked in residential school with us. They beat us. 
Thanks. Thanks for the abuse, us. We can't have a community that hands out hate literature and expect people to listen to us and take us seriously. The chief, along with three city councillors and numerous other local people, demanded the mayor step down, but he didn't. I'm not a quitter and I am determined to give everything from my heart to see this thing go ahead. Quinnell is in my heart and I'm not about to abandon it. The book at the heart of this fight has sold well. It's a top seller on Amazon and is widely available in public libraries. But the Union of BC Indian Chiefs calls it residential school denialism. I think that it was incumbent upon Mayor Paul to make a clear statement that he rejects that type of uh, racist publication and clearly he's failed to do that. There is no mechanism to force a mayor to resign, but local First Nations say they will refuse to work with them, a blow for reconciliation efforts in Quinnell. Betsy Trumpener, CBC News, Prince George. The city of Kelowna has now removed a senior from his property to enforce a demolition order. For the past 15 years, Janusz Gerlecki has been renovating his home on the edge of the city without the needed building permits. The city argues those renovations made the property unsafe and unsightly. Last month, it notified the 73-year-old it was going to tear down his home. And on Tuesday, it forced him off the property. Gerlecki says he's now sleeping in his truck outside his house. I, I try to... I try to catch up in my head what I do now, where I stayed. Because I don't have a shower, no water, no shave. A recent engineer's report claims the structure of Gerlecki's home does not warrant demolition. He has filed for a court injunction that is yet to be heard by a judge. The city is defending its decision, saying Gerlecki has had years to deal with the issues on the property. Britannia Rink in East Vancouver is now closed indefinitely while it undergoes repairs. The rink is home to the city's only women and gender diverse hockey programs. As Janelle Hamilton explains, and as players, very concerned. Britannia Ice Rink is looking a little bare these days after Brian Leak shuttered the facility. It's devastating to all of us and nowhere else to go. For this group of hockey players, that means there are no other options to lace up their skates, as Britannia is the only rink in the city that offers women and gender diverse hockey programs for all skill levels. As someone who identifies as non-binary, being able to come to a space where I know that I am welcome, where I know I can be myself, I don't have to change my pronouns um, to fit what's going on. Everyone is very welcoming and it's, yeah, it's been great for it, my own mental health. The Vancouver Park Board says it is working to identify nearby locations where rink programming can be temporarily relocated. We've been looking at adjusting our own internal programming versus taking away from other existing groups. So programs such as public skates and then also just exploring potentially options in other municipalities. But as a busy single mom, Heather Manis says it's vital the city urgently finds locations that are easily accessible. We're going to be you know that's quite a long drive from where I live in Vancouver and it just seems a bit ridiculous where there's so many rinks in the city that there's no other female all-female programs or you know gender diverse programs. Owakawa who works for the city says the park board needs to step up and do better when it comes to improving access and equity. The co-ed leagues here are very male dominated. The closure at Britannia has highlighted that this is an important program that people uh, are missing and are needing in their lives and and there should be more inclusive spaces. The park board says providing accessible gender diverse programming is top priority, but there are no plans to expand the programs beyond Britannia for now. It's something that we're looking to update uh, over the coming years to, to support um, broader access to the community. We all love hockey. We're Canadian. People love this sport and there's got to be room for everybody. There is no word yet on when Britannia Rink will reopen. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Online retail store Sheen is opening a pop-up in Vancouver next week. The company has grown in popularity on social media for its inexpensive prices and range of options. 
but it's also made headlines for its harmful environmental impact and harsh working conditions. The CBC's Karis Hogg hit the streets to find out what shoppers think. I'm here on the corner of Robson and Granville at the location of the Sheen pop-up to see what people think about it coming here. It's like affordable clothing, right? So it's like good for people who can't afford clothes around here, I guess. I kind of like have mixed feelings on it, but yeah, like I feel like everyone gets things off there, whether it's like little beauty bits or little home decors and stuff. So I think it'll be fun. It just feels weird that they're doing an in-person store because I feel like their quality is known for being really bad. So you want to like make sure it's good quality before you get it and with Sheen you never know. So it's better to check it in person of course. It's good if we have a physical store because it, uh, we can see how, uh, how the clothes look like on us. I don't know, some people don't like the fact that they're not very, no, they're not very, what was the word I'm looking ethical. I just... It, I haven't heard good things about the quality of and the labor practices seems really sketchy. I think they kind of sell things really cheap and maybe not the best quality stuff. I don't know. It's I don't want to support their business, but at the same time, they have really cheap stuff. So I, I've only heard kind of negative things about it. I will definitely check it out when it comes just to have a nose eh, and see. <laughs> it's good and bad at the same time. So I guess if it's good for you, go ahead. If you don't like to, don't go. Personally, I don't think it's the right idea. A little too fast for this old guy. At least nine people have been killed and hundreds more are injured after a major earthquake rocked Taiwan. The quake was also felt in China and sparked a tsunami warning for southern Japan and the Philippines. Philippe Leblanc has more from Taipei. Striking Wednesday morning with a force unseen in Taiwan for 25 years, the 7.2 magnitude earthquake brought down buildings. <laughs> caused landslides and rattled bridges, leaving dozens either trapped or missing. Rescue crews scrambled to get to them safely. Taiwan's president-elect surveyed the damage in the hard-hit city of Hualien, a popular tourist destination on the east coast of Taiwan, just 25 kilometers from the earthquake's epicenter. He's promising rescue efforts will be the priority. We need to find out how many people are still trapped, he says. Those injured should be given quality medical treatment. Still, people in Taiwan are coming to grips with what just transpired with staggering sights like this live broadcast rocked by the tremors. Further north, in New Taipei, more destruction. This resident says she's mourning the loss of the 60-year-old buildings that collapsed in her neighborhood. We are lucky that no one got hurt here, adds this person. Another piece of good fortune? Tsunami warnings from Japan to the Philippines, later downgraded and averted. Still, Canada's Prime Minister is offering aid to those who need it. Canada stands ready to provide support and have reached out to Taiwanese officials. We're also engaging to make sure affected Canadians have the support they need. Back in Taiwan, officials say the number of victims and the extent of damage remains relatively low for an earthquake of this magnitude. A similar one here a quarter century ago caused nearly 2,500 deaths and over 11,000 injuries. Darius Madavi joins us with a first look at the weather and uh, an update on the earthquake there. Yes, well, uh, as we heard, uh, a very damaging earthquake. We saw a lot of the, the uh, damage there. Uh, this is not unusual for the area. This is a very seismically active area. It's on the border between tectonic plates, much like BC is, uh, or off the coast of BC. Uh, so it's not unusual, but this is the most, uh, the largest earthquake that they've seen in 25 years, give or take. Uh, and so it was, again, significant. Fortunately, those tsunami warnings did not pan out. We did not see those three meter uh, maximum wave heights that were forecasted. So a little bit of good news there, but the cleanup will take a while. 
And again, even though the region is uh, responsible for as much as 25%, a quarter of all the major earthquakes around the world, uh, still uh, uh, certainly a, an out of the ordinary situation. And now let's turn to here in Vancouver, where we don't really have anything out of the ordinary, fairly calm conditions across the province. That uh, precipitation, we're seeing those scattered showers and flurries starting to ease off over the next uh, tw uh, 12, 24 hours or so. Now there will be some more precipitation coming for the more southern parts of the interior as we get later into this week and into the weekend. But again, just scattered, nothing too significant. And in the meantime, we do see that cloud starting to clear out for what will be a pretty nice day tomorrow. For Vancouver, the cloud might actually return for a brief period tomorrow morning before clearing out again just before noon. But overall, pretty calm conditions and we're going to see the next system not roll in until the end of this week. So for now, relatively calm. Expect a couple sunny days ahead once right. that cloud clears out tomorrow morning. Okay, we'll check in later, Darius. Thanks very much. Thank you. An orphaned orca is still stranded in a Vancouver Island lagoon. After the break, an update on the calf and a deep dive into recent orca research. Much of it spearheaded here in BC. Stick around. And hello to everyone watching our commercial free live stream tonight. More than 200 musical artists are calling for protections against artificial intelligence technology. They include some of the biggest names in the industry, from Billie Eilish to Sheryl Crow, and even the estate of Frank Sinatra. They've signed an open letter to tech companies, developers, and digital music services to stop using AI to undermine or replace human songwriters and artists. More now from Eli Glasner. Is it beyond intelligence? As if the song not exist? That's a little taste of evolution. A new song from Sheryl Crow where she explores her concerns around the use of artificial intelligence in the music industry. Now, Crow is part of a group of more than 200 artists who are now calling on AI developers and technology companies to stop using AI to undermine or devalue their work. Now, the letter is from an organization called Artists' Rights Alliance. Other artists lending their support include Elvis Costello, Nicki Minaj, the estate of Frank Sinatra, and Canadian artists such as the Arkells and Diana Krall. In a recent interview with Tom Power on Q, the musician Sheryl Crow talked about her concerns over AI and its use, increasing use, in the music industry. You know, it terrifies me that artists can be brought back from the dead. It terrifies me that I can sing to you a song that I had absolutely nothing to do with, and you'll believe it. Jen Jacobson is the executive director of the group that organized the letter. She says that AI is also a concern for estates managing the rights of artists such as Frank Sinatra. A lot of that um, royalty potential is being cut into by AI in various ways. You know, sometimes we're seeing now these deep fakes and voice clones where people are are uh, taking an, a famous artist and and. Um, uh, uh, exploiting their likeness that way. And with the abilities of AI software increasing, musicians already struggling with decreasing income from music streaming rights are worried about being replaced. Tiff Merritt is an Americana musician. I've spent 25 years honing my, my touch, my voice, my point of view. Um, my writing sensibilities, and that's now being used to train AI to imitate and replace me. Uh, and, and robots do not get royalties. Their content is free. Organizers and artists are calling on AI developers and technology companies to work with artists ethically so that this technology doesn't further devalue their work. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. An orphaned orca calf has been stranded in a lagoon near Zabalos on Vancouver Island for two weeks now. Now, rescue officials say they plan to airlift the young orca to open water. 
Rescuers say the whale seems healthy and has been looking for prey, but the way out of that water is shallow and hard to navigate. Officials say the calf will be placed in a sling and lifted out by helicopter. It will then be held in a pen as they wait for its pod to get nearby. So the last few weeks have seen a deluge of orca research published, much of it done right here in BC. Our Darius Madabi joins us now to tell us about the world of killer whales. Darius, our province has seen several types of orcas, but perhaps to a more casual eye, they may all seem the same. Explain that a bit. Right. Uh, well, a trained eye can see the differences between, for example, uh, BC's southern resident orcas and transient orcas. I don't have that trained eye, but some people do, uh, because these are more than just different populations. They have different shapes, different sizes, different food sources, different habits, and different patterns on those patches on them, those white patches, uh, which is why scientists classify orcas into ecotypes. Now, if you take a look here, you can see uh, residents, uh, resident whales eat salmon. They have those rounded fins. Uh, the southern ones are in the Salish Sea, and the northern resident whales are found north of Vancouver Island up to Alaska. Then you have the transient whales, or the bigs, uh, the bigs orcas. Mm -hmm. uh, they eat marine mammals like seals or whales. They have a more pointed fin and a wider range, including uh, further away from the coast. Then there's another one that you might be less familiar with, offshore uh, whales that are orcas that eat sharks and large fish. They have a more rounded fin and are further from the coast, but they don't stray too far. And then lastly, we have one uh, potentially new type of orca recently found in a new paper, uh, but they've, they're found much further offshore. They eat mammals, including sperm whales and also turtles, uh, and they have both rounded and pointed fins. So I know that was a lot, but this last group, which researchers, researchers say is likely a new population, was discovered thanks to some detailed orca genealogy when UBC master student Josh McInnes was building killer whale family trees from a massive database of images and found 49 images of orcas that didn't seem to fit in anywhere. Here's what his research supervisor and UBC prof Andrew Trites told us. We tend to call it the oceanic population of killer whales. We suspect that they are distant cousins of transient killer whales, but we don't know whether or not they still get together for social events on occasion or whether or not they cut the family lines, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years ago. Darius, how do we know whether this really is a new population? What will it take? Uh, the key is data. And fortunately, since publishing their paper, Trite says they've gotten a massive influx of images to analyze. But by far the most reliable way to find out where these orcas fit into the family tree, or perhaps the evolutionary tree if we're talking larger time scales, uh, is to test their DNA, which is why McInnes is heading out to the open ocean to try and collect some samples. But this all leads us to another paper that was published recently, which called our whole system for categorizing orcas into question. Right now, every single orca in the world, from Antarctica to BC to the North Atlantic, is considered one species. But should they be? Uh, the paper compared transient and resident killer whales, including ones right here in BC, which never mate, even though they can often be found in the same areas, like in the Salish Sea. And the paper highlighted other differences, including major ones in their skulls, as discovered by co-author and UBC grad student Carissa Fung. Here's what one expert told us. Modern genetic techniques have shown that these residents and the transients now known as Biggs killer whales probably split from um, a, a single lineage historically or prehistorically two or 300,000 years ago. And so they've been on different evolutionary trajectories for many thousands of years. So some scientists argue the species status ought to change, but will they, and if so, when? It's hard to say. I mean, this is really just a first step. Uh, this paper is a formal suggestion that some ecotypes of orca receive species status, specifically the resident and the transient orcas. Uh, from here, the Committee on Taxonomy for the Society for Marine Mam Mammology, it's quite a mouthful, uh, let's say they accept the designation uh, once they, they analyze it. Uh, what happens with all the other populations of orcas around the world? Multiple experts told us this could be opening the door to a lot more changes. Maybe down the road, uh, a, a new species will be proposed for this offshore killer whale form as well. But again, the distinctions aren't quite as obvious and as significant as the differences between the, the residents and the big killer whales, which is why that this is a pretty straightforward case to bring forward. And of course, perhaps the biggest question, at least if you ask me, what will these new species be called? Uh, the paper did suggest a new name for the resident and transient ecotypes, but those are far from set in stone. And given how many different populations and types of orcas there are out there, the committee may decide to go with a more formalized approach than what was proposed in the paper. But honestly, Dan, whatever they go with, it's going to be hard to top the original. Uh, Orsinus orca, the current scientific name for all orcas, means whales of the kingdom of the dead. 
and it doesn't get much better than that. About sums it up. Science and climate specialist Darius Madavi, thanks very much. After an 11-year-old boy was killed by two dogs in Edmonton, we have more questions about how it happened and concerns that previous complaints were left unaddressed. Stick around. With an immense score of 312, bringing their total score to 1,275, the duo that charmed a nation. We just, uh, it was crazy. Like, we just didn't expect it at all. Yeah, like last year, last year we kind of, <laughs> we didn't do great. We got like 15th out of 16 or something. Mm -hmm. So like we went up, just, we were just like, we're gonna have a good time. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna expect to do well. We're not gonna get a bunch of points. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna share our art and then yeah. like have a good time in Ottawa and watch the games. And then also it's kind of like unheard of for like a Newfoundland team to even make finals. It happened once in 95. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's like we're the first Atlantic team to win finals. We're the first two person team to win finals. First Newfoundland team. I did like, I mean, we did our first scene and I was like, that wasn't actually that bad. <laughs> like, I was like, maybe we can do it. Yeah. And then we got to finals, and then like, cause our, our like pipe dream goal was to like, maybe make it to finals. There's yeah. like multiple videos of me both at the round robin and at finals of me just like, when the scores are being read. Like, yeah, I was just like, like <laughs> it's crazy, out, it was nuts. Yeah. And for our Midwest emo inspired character event, we are looking for- We're the, wondering. We're wondering why you're breaking up with us. It could be because we collect roadkill. Or because we only pay with pennies. Mm. Canadian Improv Games is a uh, national theater charity. It's, uh, it started 47 years ago. Schools from all around the country come and uh, compete. There were 15 teams, I believe. All, except for us, all teams of eight. We're at the dinner table, eating straight tomato, straight tomato, raw, smushed up. This feels fried. wrong. <laughs> we we mesh really well because I do a lot of uh, theater and Isaac does a lot of music. Yeah. So we're like like different creative worlds forms kind of, of the come arts together. coming together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been doing it for six years together. Like. We won the junior tournament in grade seven and eight, so like it was like just like let's go out and have fun. Mm -hmm. Jessica had all ten of her gold medals around her neck. It was like they jangled around everywhere she walked. Weighed her down, made her ski faster. Yeah, it was a strategy. <laughs> Jessica every day wore like ten ski jackets, four pairs of snow pants. She was like sweating constantly. I just find like improv is just like my like, social life. Like I was always when I was younger, I was a very like socially like awkward, a kind of anxious person. And I think just doing improv has just made me so much more confident in myself, my ability to talk to people mm -hmm. and like exist in like society with people. And it's really, really helped me a lot in my life. And I'm really grateful for it. Yeah, and I have to say the, the exact same <laughs> yeah. thing. Like I was a, uh, a really introverted kid growing up. Like Isaac was like my, one of my only and my closest friend growing up. And then um, we started doing improv together and like the more improv I did, the more friends I made through improv and outside of improv. <laughs> and I feel like I uh, wouldn't be as confident as a person without it. We are learning more details about the 11-year-old boy who was attacked and killed by two dogs in Edmonton on Monday. As Julia Wong tells us, the home had been visited twice before by animal control officers looking into complaints of aggressive dogs. I'm outside the house where police say an 11-year-old boy was attacked and killed by what they call two very large dogs. A small memorial sits on the driveway of the house where this happened in a quiet residential neighborhood in Edmonton. Monday night, police say they arrived to find the 11-year-old severely injured, and they tried to save him, but he was pronounced dead at the scene. The city says animal control had been to this house before, and that there had been two other complaints this year about attacks inside the home. The boy was a student at a school in Osoyoos, British Columbia. The superintendent says counselors have been called in to support students and staff during this difficult time. It's just, it, it's gut-wrenching, it really is. And uh, it's, a, it's tough with the nature of the accident and with the young age 
of, uh, of the young man who is involved. I think we all expect that uh, when people take on the responsibility of uh, having pets uh, in their private homes uh, and uh, that they will uh, uh, live up to the expectations that are in the uh, in the in the li licensing bylaw, uh, and that they be responsible pet owners. And uh, in this case, I don't know what happened, but uh, the outcome is very tragic. An autopsy is being conducted today. There's no word on any charges. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Shipping through the Port of Baltimore is resuming as the cleanup from last week's deadly bridge collapse continues. Temporary channels are now allowing some vessels to move past that wreckage. The CBC's Katie Simpson has exclusive Canadian access to the scene with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. When you get up close to the wreckage site, it really puts into perspective the scale and the scope of this catastrophe. We're maybe about 30 meters from the actual debris pile, uh, the ship, the Dolly cargo ship, and the ongoing cleanup efforts, specially trained engineers who are using torches to shear through the metal debris as they try to cut up chunks of the wreckage into smaller, more manageable pieces so that they can be hauled away from this site in the ongoing effort to clean things up. Now, it's going to take quite some time to do. There's no real estimate as to when this site may be cleaned up. They have to move meticulously. They don't want to have an incident within an incident. There's concern that if they move too quickly, something could fall. There could be another collapse or something could move and put these crews in danger. Now, this is about as close as we can get right now. Divers are actually in the water. It's unusual because the weather has been so miserable. There's been so much rain. There's been thunder. There's been lightning. And it's made these already incredibly difficult cleanup efforts even more dangerous. So these crews, with weather and daylight permitting, are continuing to move the debris from the site. Now, there has been a little bit of encouraging news here. They have been able to get up two temporary channels opened up so that some of the ships can move in and out of the harbor. But for now, this, with this here, this is what normal looks like. Katie Simpson, CBC News, in the Baltimore Harbor. It has been two days since seven aid workers were killed in Gaza. One of them is a former soldier with roots here in Canada. As his father mourns, he argues the attack was a targeted one by Israeli defense forces. More now from Sarah Levitt. Jacob Flickinger was a new father, a Canadian veteran. Now his family is working to bring his body home from Gaza. He believed very strongly that the work he was doing was important, especially in this case, knowing that there was starvation out there. Flickinger was one of the seven aid workers killed by a series of Israeli airstrikes on their aid convoy in Gaza on Monday. Born in Saint-Georges, Quebec, to a Quebec mom and an American dad, he spent more than a decade in the Canadian Army, including a tour in Afghanistan. This fall, he decided to use his military training and joined the World Central Kitchen to help the nonprofit with logistics and security. Their convoy was marked, clearly marked, um, and they are on a well-used humanitarian route. So... In my opinion, it was a targeted kill. Flickinger's parents say they're mourning, but they're also angry. World Central Kitchen says its aid convoy had just dropped off food supplies in a central Gaza warehouse when it was hit by precision strikes. This, despite coordinating its movements with the Israeli army beforehand and traveling within a de-conflicted zone. We call for a full investigation. Israel needs to respect international humanitarian law. The strikes also killed an Australian, Polish and three British nationals, as well as a Palestinian, sparking international condemnation. Israel's military says an independent body will investigate. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex conditions. It shouldn't have happened. That's not good enough for Jacob Flickinger's parents. The people who are suffering now are the innocent on both sides, the civilians, and it's continuing a cycle that will never end unless we make a break with this violence. The family has set up a fundraising campaign to help Flickinger's wife and 18-month-old son as they adjust to a life 
without him. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Two years after Russia invaded Ukraine, one family is looking back at their journey from war to Canada. After the break, we catch up with a Ukrainian family who has made Vancouver their new home. It's a normal day out here now. But on Monday at eclipse time, it will be much different out here. Christina Hare doesn't expect her dog to notice, but they won't be out here walking during it. I'm not really concerned because she does sleep really well during the night. Um, so I don't think it'll throw her off too much. She might have a nap and I'll make sure to maybe not take her outside during that time. Specialists in animal behavior say an eclipse can cause pets or farm animals to act differently, especially if they're already nervous. This could set them off just a little bit. Um, the big response that is reported is one of nonspecific fear or anxiety, simply because this is so uncertain. Dr. Karen Overall says animals often act as they would at nighttime, but they might also think it's a storm, which could be stressful. For larger animals, having some kind of shelter or a barn can help. Trainers at this Charlottetown track plan to keep their horses in the barn, which is also a darker environment. I'm not necessarily, I don't really know if it would harm them or not, but to be on the safe side, just keep them in the barn and just when it kind of passes and then kind of go about your everyday, everyday thing pretty well. Miles Heffernan says it makes sense to protect human and animal eyes, and vets agree. There, there are people who will have, will have goggles for their dog. This veterinarian says it is harder to control larger animals, but pets should be kept inside if they're at risk of looking at the sun. Some animals are far more sensitive to different types of light than we are. So, you know, you'd want to be, you'd want to be a little careful there. In the past, researchers have reported birds gathering on the ground and looking at the eclipse, and some primate animals in zoos have pointed at it and cows have thought it's milking time. Experts say it's good to plan ahead to keep animals safe. Laura Meter, CBC News, Charlottetown. So I know when I really like a song, if within the first three seconds, I'm already vibing to it. Hey, I'm Rohith Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. It's not one person dictating what good music is. It's the community sharing what good music is. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. Darius Mandavi joins us with the full BC-wide forecast, and you have an update on a wildfire. Yes, we still have them burning. Yes, yeah, still burning, and uh, uh, new ones being ignited. There's been at least one new fire in the last 24 hours, and uh, our first that I've seen out of control fire of the year. Uh, I'm not saying it is the first one. It's the first one that I've I've seen. Uh, it was out of control as of this morning, but 
as of around 3 p.m. Uh, it was declared and now just being held, so a little bit of good news there. It is just west of Merritt, as we saw there, and around the Canford area. Uh, and again, now that it is under, uh, it is listed as being held, is a little bit of good news. It means that it is no longer spreading, and uh, hopefully, as conditions continue to improve into tomorrow in the southern interior, uh, we should see it hopefully uh, move from being held to under control. Uh, with that being said, fire danger is still relatively low across the province. If anything, it has dropped since uh, we looked yesterday. Uh, in the southern interior, we have some areas that are still, uh, they're, they're low and little patches of moderate, but for the most part, we're going to see that drop even more tomorrow. We're still cool. We're going to see a, a, a few more showers tonight into tomorrow, uh, and then we're not clearing up until probably the weekend, but even then, we are likely to see a, a, another system move in. So, Tomorrow, uh, at first we were expecting Vancouver to be um, cloudy on Friday. Then it seemed that cloud was shifting into Thursday and it was still looking very cloudy. Now it seems like some of that, uh, most of that cloud will have cleared up by mid-morning. So a little bit of good news there for many people uh, on the coast because that's really the case across the board. Up the sea to sky, Squamish and Whistler may see a little bit of uh, rain tomorrow, especially in the morning, but then we should be clearing up as well. And then really nothing but sun for the coast into this weekend. Uh, for the rest of the province, though, clearing up generally for the northern half of BC, anywhere really north of the Caribou, but again for the southern interior, a little bit more activity still in the way, especially for the southeast, but generally speaking, nothing too extreme, uh, uh, no warnings or anything like that here in BC. On the side of the country, very different. Uh, that storm system that was moving up through the U.S. that brought tornadoes and uh, some very deadly uh, damaging conditions uh, is now moving up into Ontario where they're seeing snow warnings because of all the snow that's expected to drop. So at least we can be thankful that's not happening here. Uh, we're seeing those temperatures across the province slowly come up over the next couple days as we continue to see those calm conditions. So a little bit of good news there again. Besides that precipitation in the south, which should start to clear up a little bit as we get into the weekend, we're generally just sunny across the board. Everywhere else in the province, we're going to see any cloud clear up tonight for a beautiful sunny day tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon. We'll take it. Thanks very much, Darius. Thank you. It has been a little over two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. Thousands of refugees have come to Canada since then. The Baba Yeva family settled here in Vancouver last August after a long journey from their home in Kharkiv. The CBC's Gurpreet Cambo caught up with them to talk about fleeing war and life here. I first met the Baba Yeva family when I was wading through a foot deep of snow in David Lamb Park. I was talking to people about Vancouver's first big snow day this season. We are happy every day on small things like this, like winter, like snowballs, like snowmen and everything. They told me about how this was their first Canadian snowman. They'd come to Canada about six months earlier as refugees from the Ukraine. About a month later, they invited me to their apartment to hear more about their story. Did you find those photos we were looking for? Okay, it's our home and our okay. view. We it's definitely view. loved it. And it's like 20 kilometers to Russian border. Yeah, from here. Like from here, right, in this here. direction. The view from... This is our balcony here our now. Balcony. The shattered window glass and debris in these images shows just how close Russian bombs came to hitting their home. Up to 15 uh, missiles every day. Every day at 10 p.m. And it was normal. It was reality. We live there. I wanted to know what life was like before the war started for Angelina, Dima, and their daughter, Masha. Our life was happy. Uh, we were happy. We were active. We had a job to do. We liked our job, right? Uh, Masha had her uh, school and friends. We had a lot of friends, like in Kharkiv and in Ukraine and overseas. Like normal school days, I was hanging out with my friends and all of this stuff. But like when the war started, I just couldn't believe that I had this life, I had this life before. It immediately divided our lives into two parts, like after and before. We were those people who didn't believe it could ever happen. But when we saw that it was not a firework um, loud, it was a real attack, so it was awful. And we decided that we have pretty much um, high floor, and it couldn't be could be uh, unsafe to stay there. They were unable to leave the city because of a fuel shortage. They went to stay with Dima's mother in a building close by. Uh, as far as I remember, on 27th of February, um, 
they uh, they just came to our city on tanks, and they had their tanks uh, in our uh, district, a city district, and we understood that we could go nowhere. We tried to sleep like together. Yeah. Uh, because it was much safer. Because if uh, the roof, for example, will be destroyed, at least we can be together and like we weren't being near the windows. We didn't um, change our clothes, for example. We just uh, continue live uh, like it was. And one more thing I remember, by the way, that we didn't know what um, uh, what kind of weekday it mm -hmm. is today. Everyone just counted like. Oh, today is the second day of the war. The most scariest to me when the planes started flying like above our heads, and I knew that they could basically just drop a bomb or a rocket on our house. I really tried to support my parents. After 10 days at their mother's, the family was evacuated to a small village in Ukraine about four hours away. But leaving wasn't so easy. We had a kind of special card right? A special map, sorry, yeah. uh, from our friends. Do you remember that? Nobody knows uh, the safe way to leave the city, mm -hmm. like, because it uh, changes day to day. And we received a map from our friends. Uh, people were on the roofs and asked another people, uh, who are you? Are you Russians? Are you Ukrainian? Tell yeah. me something that you are Ukrainian. It was or a chaos. Fire. It was a chaos. Dima decided to return to Kharkiv, thinking it would be over soon. Because it's our form and we believe that it ends in a few months. But the rest of the family went to Germany, where they believed it would be safer. They stayed for four months and then rejoined Dima in Kharkiv. They tried to resume a normal life, but still found it difficult to feel safe in their city. I used to play volleyball outside with my friends, like, you know, the school. Even uh, when I heard all of this, like attacks, bombs, we were just like, oh, okay, let's just, let's just wait for like five minutes maybe, and then we just came back and play again. If you come back at home and start hiding every minute, every hour, you can't focus on your work, you can't focus on your family, you can't focus on your life at all. You just stop living. We decided to pick up all the documents and to get our visas. They applied to come to Canada under the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel program. Getting documents took more than a year, but in summer 2023, they set off for Vancouver. We decided to just to take the most necessary things, like I can even share with you. So this card is for me, like for beloved mother, <laughs> yeah, for mommy. Yeah with the best wishes for every day. My mom was really sad, so I make her this card, like, it says smile, and okay. it has a smile face here. And it actually works, too. Yeah. Despite any challenges and uh, any bumps and, uh, you know, anything around us, just uh, because here we are, you know, we have Masha, we have each other, we have Teddy, our anti-stress anti yeah, boy. We're so happy that we can uh, be with Teddy in Germany because he's like our sunshine. Yeah. The family landed in Vancouver in August of 2023. When I first came to school here in Vancouver, I wasn't really used to it because I uh, didn't come to school for four years, I think. Four and a half. No, no, yeah. no three and a half. Like, yeah, it's okay. I think so. Because yeah. first, uh, it was COVID and then the war. So I just came to my school for the first time and I was just like, oh, so many students, so many real people in the same time. I was surprised and shocked a bit. And I think it took about uh, two weeks to get used to it. But now I'm really happy that I can come like in society and be together with my friends. They now live in an apartment in downtown Vancouver with a big patio view, just like the one in Kharkiv. Our favorite spot in the house is here because uh, it's a family spot, so to say. So it's our first peak with my husband where when we met in Odessa uh, more than 15 years ago. 
And here you can see the warmest presents from our daughter as for the best mom and dad. So she made it when she was six or seven years old. And we took it with us to evacuation. So it's, it really warms up here, yeah, deep inside. It's an annual transformation that could take more than a month. But for one elephant seal, he's inclined to take his yearly molt to the people. Meet a not so shy Emerson after this. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Stream your favorite CBC dramas or comedies 24-7 on demand on the CBC Gem app. Plus, you can live stream CBC Vancouver News. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. Take a walk on the seawall and you might be lucky to spot an animal. Maybe a whale, an otter, or a seal. Mm-hmm. But you're not likely to stumble over that creature on the pathway unless 
It's Emerson. Yes, Emerson the elephant seal. He set up shop right by a city bench in Saanich, taking his annual molt straight to the people. And he's drawing a crowd. Take a look. Normally what they do is they'll fence off and put some signs up so that the uh, community knows not to go near them. Uh, you don't want to disturb them when they're molting. <laughs> What? Yeah. Scared? Scared? Yeah. Why are you scared? I don't like it. <laughs> What's that doing? He's, he's resting. He's molting. <laughs> so I couldn't believe that this was actually happening, that this seal was here. He's well known for them. He shows up here a few times, but they've tracked him from uh, all the way from California, and he's apparently a resident around here now. Look at that, he's, wa he's wa wagging his tail right now. He seems to like you guys. Looks fabulous. I wouldn't mind blazing out like he is at the moment. I've seen sunbathers at Kitts Beach with more modesty. <laughs> Wow. I mean, that's the life, though, yeah, right? Yeah, no, sure. Yeah. yeah. Hang out on the, on the south coast, shed, yeah. whatever you want to. I wish to. I molted. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Watch people get selfies with you. Not bad. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on CBC Gem, our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And we will have your next local news at 11 o'clock right here after the National. See you then.